tip 45 degrees, and this is that line, normal line, that hits this lower hemisphere projection at that point. So you see the point over there is just what you see from the top. So you could say, oh, why don't we just do three-dimensional plots? Because they're kind of, they're kind of a mess if you do too many. For example, you know, if I were to add uh, another fault over here, another one over there, if I'm do mapping faults in a wellbore, if we go to the 3D version, you see it's too much stuff to, to look at especially if you have some other plane in, in the other uh, conjugate direction. But in 2D, you will just see points over there, which is much, much easier to, to interpret. So, um, the other problems are very similar. Uh, this is, for example, 110 strike. 60 degrees towards the northeast. Remember, the point is going to be always opposite to where the fault is dipping. And C and D are very similar. And I, I encourage that, that you check that with, with that app that uh, I sent you. So the next point is about calculating stresses in the plane of the fault. And that calculation of stresses, we said it's very important whenever uh, the state of stress is approaching sheer failure. Uh, in this homework, I, I don't have particularly a lot of applications for uh, showing you know, how you apply this in uh, petroleum engineering, but uh, that's mostly in, in, in the lectures. But let me show you this example of fault reactivation. So this is an example of fault reactivation in campus basin in, in Brazil. So they, they were, um, it's unclear how they, they managed to do that, but, but this, this was not happening before they, doing any, they were doing anything, right? So this is a fault that reactivated and propagated all the way to the seafloor uh, so that uh, now after that, Let's play it again. After reactivation, the fluid starts to move through the fault. And because hydrocarbons are buoyant, they just go up and are leaking. And, and you can see very clearly, that's the line of the fault. This will be the strike, the line of the strike, right? We don't know the dip from, from this image. And and then after they, they killed uh, that leak, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't leak anymore. Well, they still have a little bit of hydrocarbons going through. So for reactivation, it, it, it's a very serious uh, topic. And actually, now that uh, whenever you, you want to maintain your pressure to produce more fluids uh, and you inject some other fluids, uh, always you should be careful about not reactivating faults uh, in situ. All right. Let's come back to the homework. Uh, last problem. Number six. Problem number six. You need to use the Mohr circle in order to calculate shear and normal stress. All right. So, uh, the, this is the data, SH max, SH min, pore pressure, all of that, friction coefficient. And the first thing I, I would do in this case is to interpret that data and to draw a, a, a block diagram. So in this block diagram, we know what is the north, we know what is the east, we know vertical stress, we know minimum principal stress coming in this direction and maximum is in that direction. And as you may know this, this is 60, this is 40, this is 45, therefore this is strike slip. After you do that, you know pore pressure, you can calculate your effective stresses. Next step uh, is given information about a particular fault, 
this case, this one is north-south, 65 degrees uh, to the east. You have to calculate what is the normal stress and the shear stress on that fault. So how do you start? Well, first thing I would do is I would draw that fault. I would draw the fault and I will try to recognize uh, which are the stresses that are making that fault move. Imagine for a minute that you don't have this stress, you don't have that stress. You just have the vertical stress. Would that block move if you just had vertical stress? What do you think? I apply stress on this one and there is nothing on that side. Would it move? Yes, right? Can, can you see that? So if you put weight on this, this is going to move down. Imagine, imagine it's a frictionless interface. You put weight on it, it will move down. Now let's get rid of this one and that one, and let's put stress on this side. And this is frictionless. You push from this side, this one will move in this direction too. But let's look at this one. What about if you had stress on this side in the two directions? Right? Before we had this one here, this one there, it moves. This one here, this one there, this one moves up. But if you had this SH max without the other two, would this one move or not? It, you, can you see that it won't move? It won't move because it has the same stress on the two sides. The same stress that you're applying here is the same that you would apply on this back face. And the two are the same, so it won't move. So that intermediate stress, or that other stress, that in-plane stress, uh, it's not going to make this thing move. And if that's not going to make this thing move, therefore, it doesn't participate in defining what is the normal stress and the shear stress on that plane. Only you use SV and SH mean. So you use SV and SH mean for this fault. And, and one more thing, before we go to the Mohr circle, uh, always recognize what is the angle that we need to plot in the Mohr circle. Uh, which is larger uh, here, SV or SH mean? SV, right? So if SV is the largest, then you have to go from the plane of the largest to the plane of the lowest, and it's going to be that angle. 65, which in this case coincides with the dip, but it's not going to be always the case. This is the angle that you need to go in the Mohr circle. So we said we just need sigma v and sigma h mean, right? So you go to the Mohr circle over here, sigma v, 25, sigma h, v, sigma h mean, 20. The angle that you need is 65 times 2. That point over there is the fault that we were looking at before. In order to calculate normal stress and shear stress, you just get the center of this circle, the radius of this circle, and which are those two, and you can calculate the shear stress and the normal stress with those equations that, that we talked about before. An interesting uh, thing to calculate here is very similar as as we sometimes compare sigma 1 to sigma 3, which is the value of the stress and isotropy, and we compare that to Q, it's exactly the same to make the ratio of shear stress to normal stress and compare that to the friction angle. If that ratio is close to the friction angle, uh, the friction coefficient, uh, then that will mean that you are close to shear failure so that you are close to that line. But in this case, notice, this is very small. It's about 0.1, and the friction coefficient is 0.6. So this, this is kind of far from shear failure. It, this is not going to slip if, uh, with these stresses uh, in this location. Let's go to the next one. Uh, next one, it's a case with a fault with a strike east-west so this is the line, and we dip 35 degrees. Notice now that the stress doesn't play any role now in making this block move, if it were to move, 
is SH min. And you just need SV and SH max. Which is the largest between SH max and, and SV? In this case, this is 60 and this is 45, so it's SH max. This is the plane of the maximum stress, which is similar to this one that I have here in, in the dashed line. And the angle that you need to go in the Mohr circle from the plane of S1 to the plane of S3, which will be that one, is from here to there. The complementary angle of the dip, which in this case is 55 uh, degrees. And you go to the Mohr circle now. Remember SH max and SV, sigma H max and sigma V. From that center is, is that circle. You go 2 times 55 degrees, and it's that point over there, B. And last one, C. Now, the, this is a, let, let's just read what the problem says. It's a fall with strike of 60 degrees, but notice that the dip is 90 degrees. So this is going to be a vertical plane. So strike 60 degrees, dip 90 degrees. Uh, the stresses that make these blocks move are SH, SH max and SH min. It's not SV. SV is not going to make this one, these two blocks move if we have frictionless uh, interfaces. And the maximum principal stress in this case is SH max. The minimum is SH min. The angle between the plane of S1 and the plane of S3, if I, go, I were to go from here to there, is this one. And that one is <coughs> the complementary angle of the strike. So th this is 30, this is 60. This 30 is the one that I need in the Mohr circle. So now we're going towards the circle between sigma H max and sigma H min. 30 degrees, so 2 times 30 is that point over there. That point over there is that fault over there. You calculate what is the center of that, what is the radius. Uh, you apply the, the formulas that, that we have used so far, and, and you can calculate what is the shear stress and what is the normal stress. And you can also calculate what is the ratio between shear stress and normal stress. So in all of these cases, notice that there is one of the stresses, of the principal stresses, that is contained in one of the planes. In this case, is the vertical stress contained in a vertical plane. In this case, it's the uh, maximum horizontal stress contained in this plane. And in this case, is the minimum principal stress contained in that plane. All of those are cases that you can solve with the Mohr circle and are going to be points on those three circles. Whenever you have a plane that does not contain any of those principal stresses, you're not going to be able to solve with the Mohr circle method. But you could, but it's a lot of work. And uh, you, you don't need to know how to do that. Uh, if you want to solve that, just check the tensor method that I have in my notes and that we briefly talked about uh, last week. Uh, but you need to be able to recognize that. So if you recognize that and you say, well, this is an oblique fault, I cannot solve it, that's fine. And remember that all those ob oblique faults are going to be points inside those three circles. It's going to be probably here, there, there. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where. And uh, one more concept is that notice that for all of these cases, the ratio of shear stress to effective normal stress is lower than the friction coefficient. That means that under that state of stress, any of those faults are not going to move. And if you were even to plot the shear failure line, you will see that all of these are stable. Uh, even if you have faults inside, it's not moving everywhere. It's in equilibrium. 
if you wanted those, some of those fractures to reactivate, you will have to lower the effective stresses so that this more circle moves to the left and it gets in close to the shear failure region. And I think that's it for the homework. Um, do you have any question about this problem? No? Yes? Yes, the, all the three stresses are acting on it. And, and you say, you know, if, if we just had SH mean, this block would move like that. If we had SV, this one would move like this. And you have this one in this direction, it will always move, it will also move in that direction because this area is larger than that area over there. So there's always going to be a component, uh, whatever stress you have, that it's being projected on that plane and making that move. All right, any, any other question about homework? No? There were two more problems that if you want to solve them or you have questions about that, you're welcome to, to check the solution and to ask me questions. Uh, basically, it's just a matrix multiplication. And for the other one that we didn't have much time to, to work on, it's a problem of seismic. Uh, usually, uh, sometimes, you know, we just draw these schematics of faults, but the real uh, way in order to map these faults is really through seismic and to these images. Uh, so, for example, here, you see this is a seismic image, and if, if you were to bend a little bit this image, you will start to see uh, that at some point these lines, they kind of break in that direction. Here this is a discontinuity. So that one is, that one is a fault. So probably here you don't, you kind of see it over there, right? Here there is another, there is another, but you bend a little bit, they get much clearer. Uh, look, look at that point, for example. All right, okay. Uh, so if you have a question about this one also, you're more than welcome to stop on my office. Uh, we, we can talk about that. Uh, usually this is the work of the geologist, but you need to know how to interpret this uh, as well and, and to know where it comes from. All right, so we are done with, with the homework. For the second midterm, uh, the the meter is going to be based on the homework on fault stability and on the homework on wellboard stability. So it's just going to be uh, two uh, homeworks to, to work on that and all the conceptual part. Uh, and I'm pretty sure we're going to get on time there. All right, so let's come back to wellboard stability. Let's see what time it is. Oh, it took me a lot of time to go through that. Okay, uh, on wellboard stability, the first thing that we did uh, was to recognize, probably we, we won't have a lot of time today to go through equations, but remember the most important thing here is to recognize that whenever you have the maximum stress in the plane perpendicular to the wellboard in the opposite direction to that, you're going to find shear failure and, and in direction of that stress, you're going to find tensile failure. Um, you, our objective is to prevent this kind of failure in the wellboard. If you have a lot of shear failure, the, the, the world will get bigger and bigger and bigger and it might run into a collapse and uh, it's, it's, just going to, it's just going to fail and, and, and get filled with these cuttings and you're not going to be able to drill through. You're going to make a large cavity. If you have tensile failure, this may start and propagate very far and you're going to lose all your uh, drilling math uh, through that fracture, which is not, it's not good. Uh, either. And in the laboratory, uh, some of you have already done this and some of, of, of you are going to do it uh, today. 
you're going to load a rock sample like this one. Uh, you're going to put the maximum stress in this direction, and this is our wellbore, and you're going to produce tensile and shear failures around this wellbore. This is a very neat experiment because before you were just doing either tensile fractures or shear fractures. You, you, wouldn't, do, you wouldn't do in the, the two at the same time. But with this experiment, you're actually doing the two at the same time. Sometimes it might not happen. It depends on the strength of your rock. But uh, notice that here, if we load this rock in this direction, as we said before, you're going to expect, expect a tensile fracture here, oriented in the direction of the maximum principal stress. And it's this fracture over here. And on the sides, where most of the stresses concentrate, because remember, if you take this guy off from here, all the way it's going to go to the neighboring rock or the neighboring guy. You're going to have shear failure in this location. C can you see there the, the shear failure? So try to, in, in the lab, to find these places of shear failure. You may need a little bit of light in order to, to see where those are. But w wait a minute. I'm going to play here a little bit with the light, and you will see a little bit better. The it actually works better if I do it from the back. So can you see that shear failure in the wall of the wellboard there on the side? Those are the, those are the breakouts. And, and that, what you see over there, is the same thing that you will see in a wellboard. So let's look. You see there is a breakout, and there in the middle, well, because in the, of the geometry of this uh, wellbore, uh, it's not propagating all the way on the top of, of the wellbore, which in this case would be that section over there, but it's deviating. Uh, but you see in the back, in the back there is also tensile failure. Again, this breakout that you see over here is the same that you would see in a real world board. And if you were to image it with uh, electrosensitivity or P waves, this is what you would see. So don't worry about this one now. Let's, talk, let's see this one. This, that's an image of, of a world board. But uh, uh, you notice that there it says north, east, south, west, and north again. So this is an image which has been uh, unwrapped. So it's around the circle, but now it has been unwrapped into a plane. So these uh, sections that, that look like, like tire tracks, these are the breakouts. They are usually wide, and they are usually deep. And here you don't see very well, but more or less over there, you see there are thinner lines. Uh, those are the, the tensile uh, fractures. So probably you can see a little bit better. Look over here. Those are tensile fractures and are at 90 degrees of the breakouts. The breakouts are 180 degrees respect to each other. The tensile fractures also are at 90 degrees from the breakout, 180 from uh, each other. This is a similar one, but using resistivity. And these uh, black uh, regions mean, means that there are no, no data. OK. Um, so make sure to report that and to take pictures for your report uh, about the failure if you get to observe tensile fractures and, and breakouts. So uh, we say that in order to solve this problem, uh, we need to uh, use a solution for stresses around the, the cavity. Uh, we use what, what is called the Kirsch equation. The Kirsch equation is a solution in cylindrical coordinates, uh, which is not the same as Cartesian coordinates, but it's very similar, in which we calculate the stresses at a given distance from the center of the wellbore and at a given angle. Uh, we said that. 
uh, we can break this Kirsch equation into more or less four parts. One is the far field stress, isotropic far field stress, sigma <coughs> infinity. The second one is pore pressure in the wellbore, uh, or mud pressure uh, in the wellbore. Uh, imagine that here you have like sort of a, a membrane very similar to the one used in the actual cell, but now it's applied on the inner wall of the wellbore. That one produces a tension in the hoop stresses. Third, uh, there is the differential stress. Whenever stresses are not the same, and that's all, always, almost always uh, all cases, then you're going to have a variation of hoop stress depending at the angle in which you are with respect to that differential stress. Uh, this is exactly the same as, as this, right? So we apply stress in this direction, then you expect tension in here, which is that point over here. You expect a lot of compression over here, uh, which we, you will produce breakouts. So here you will have tensile failure, here you will have shear fractures. And the last component that we're going to add uh, to, to this uh, system of equations, of the Kirsch equations, is the, the mud pressure, but considering now the pore pressure. So if you have a piece of rock, you have a wellbore at a given wellbore pressure, but now we consider this as a porous medium in which in that porous medium you have grains and in that grain, inside those grains there is fluid with a given pore pressure then we need to consider that. Let's make a cross section of this wellbore where this is the rock and, and this is the drilling mud. So drilling mud has a lot of clay in it, right? So that's, that's why it's called the drilling mud. And this is the center. So this is the mud, this is the rock. What is a mud cake? And how do you get a mud cake? Okay, so but, in, but first of all, in order for the mud to get into the rock, you need to create a gradient of pressure, right? Your pressure in your wellbore, in the fluid in your wellbore, has to be higher than the pressure of the fluids in the rock. Otherwise, you will be producing fluids in the wellbore. So the, the first condition for this is to have the pressure in the wellbore to be higher than the pressure in the rock. Uh, if you do have a gradient, a difference between pressure in the wellbore and pressure in the rock, uh, some of the water is going to infiltrate into, into the formation. And without water, also some very small particles are going to get into. But the objective of the mud cake is to create sort of a filter of small particles that clog as they go into the formation rock and, and they create this thin layer of mud which has much higher concentration of clay particles than the mud itself. When you create this uh, fine layer of fine particles that are sort of clogging as they get into it, uh, 
if you have fine particles, you have low permeability. If you have low permeability, uh, you're going to have a sharp gradient of pressure. So the objective of, objective of this mud cake is to create, as you go from here to there, a sharp gradient of pore pressure so that now you have this difference, PW minus PP, that if you were, look, if you were to look this uh, from far away, in order to balance all those viscous forces, uh, the rock has to react with an effective stress. So uh, l let me say in, in, in other words, as that filtrate, and, and we have a gradient, so we have a fluid movement, but that, those fluids are dragging onto the particles, and all those viscous forces are pushing against the wall. And that pushing of uh, the viscous forces is what is adding this sort of effective stress support, which is mostly done by viscous forces. Uh, and if you were to look from far away, this is very similar to having a membrane, like the same membrane that you use in the triaxial cells uh, for avoiding uh, the water getting to the rock. This is very similar. But the difference is that this one, uh, you, it's, it's not as effective as having an impermeable membrane. Uh, and also that you can lose it with time. It's going to work for some time, but it's not going to work forever. And it's going to work as long as you have a gradient. If you don't have a gradient, it, it won't work. Uh, we're going to get back into this, but it's, it's very important that now uh, we, we recognize that any effective stress lateral support is going to come from the difference between the pressure in the wellbore, the mud pressure, and the, the pore pressure. Okay, so after we do that, um, then we're in conditions of writing the full Kears equation. Uh, before we do that, I'm about to sneeze. Wait. Uh, how do you calculate wall board mud pressure? Mass density times G times the height. It's very important here that we use true vertical depth, right? You don't want to use measure depth because that's going to give you a wrong value. You, you need to use uh, true uh, vertical depth. And if here, uh, sometimes drillers, they, uh, they as we're going to see later, uh, you, you design the casing for 